Hey everybody, Aaron Cat with Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're gonna talk about clearing common handgun malfunctions under low light conditions. We're not necessarily gonna get into likelihood, but possibility. So what we're talking about is a common handgun malfunction, a non-catastrophic handgun malfunction that occurs under low light conditions. Why is that different than daylight? Well, under low light conditions, we may not have the ambient lighting available to really get the data that we necessarily need with our eyes. And whether you know it or not, at an unconscious level, we do take into a, take a lot of information into their eyes because that's our primary sense of information for situations such as a handgun malfunction. Even if you teach yourself to stay threat focused when you fix things, you're still taking in peripheral data from things in your visual horizon to help you, well, fix malfunctions. So under low light conditions, there are some complications that we have to address. And of course, we also have to talk about the two different types of ways we will be shooting in low light conditions, which would be either a weapon mounted light or a handheld light. The three malfunctions we're going to look at are the most common three, which would be a failure to fire, uh, what's commonly referred to as a stovepipe, and of course, what's commonly referred to as a double feed. Those are the three common handgun malfunctions we're gonna look at for clearing under low light conditions. We're, also, we're gonna look at handheld, and then we're gonna look at weapon mounted light techniques. Of the three malfunctions, the failure to fire is a malfunction that can occur right out of the holster. Uh, if you do some searching on the internet, you can find some situations where law enforcement officers have drawn their duty gun and the round in the chamber did not fire. And of course, that can be operator error. If you chamber the same round too many times, you may render it inert by beating the primer compound out of the primer. Uh, which means the firing pin or the striker, or whatever operating system you have, is not going to be able to ignite the primer, to ignite the powder, I should say, and fire the round. So ammunition maintenance can go a long way towards preventing this. Of course, some people press check like it's an OCD obsession to make sure that there's a round in the chamber. Um, empty chamber can also cause a failure to fire, but it's a malfunction that occur right out of the holster. So if I'm using a handheld light, there isn't really any difficulties with this technique. Uh, I'm going to have my handheld light. Hopefully you've got some kind of retention device. I use a Theorem switchback because it allows me to retain the light, do things, and then put the light back into whatever position I'm going to use. Uh, the failure to fire right out of the holster, if I'm aimed in, I'm using whatever technique I'm using, and I get that click, what I want to do in my practice is start to listen to what the gun is telling me without visual data. If the environment is dark enough that I can't physically get any fine detail on the firearm itself, which doesn't necessarily apply to this technique, but it's going to come up in other malfunctions that we're going to address, I have to pay attention closer to what the gun is doing versus what it's not doing. If I pull the trigger and I get a full trigger press with the striker falling or the hammer falling, that feels different than a dead trigger, which is common on other types of malfunctions. So that immediately tells me that the most likely cause for what just happened is either an empty chamber or bad ammunition. And the technique to clear it, everybody knows, is going to be tap and then rack the gun. Now, some people look at it like, oh, I've got a flashlight in my hand. It's not that big of a deal. If you've got a retention device, you can just roll it out of the way in order to be able to rack that gun. But first I've got to tap it and then we'll address retention device versus no retention device with the uh, the handheld light. I'm aiming, I get that click. Now how do I tap it? Well I can tap it off my thigh, I can inboard the gun and hit it off my chest. That's not that big of a deal. Muzzling concern also has to be taken into account. Which way can you safely point the gun when you clear the malfunction? Uh, but if I'm not worried about anything in my immediate area being on that horizontal in that direction, tapping it off my chest is one technique I can use. I can also bring a thigh up and tap it off my leg. I can tap it off my belt buckle. I can tap it off of any hard surface. Once it's been tapped, I then have to rack it. If I've got a retention device, I can roll it out of the way, manipulate from the front or the rear, and then I can reassess my threat and decide if I actually need to shoot. Now, if you don't have a retention device, you're using a handheld flashlight and there's no kind of loop or shock cord or, or theorem switchback or ring or, or something you've built yourself on the, on the flashlight, it's not the end of the world. What we're gonna remember to do is tuck the light against our thumb so we have four fingers to use versus tucking it in our fingers and leaving us only a thumb to manipulate the gun. So this is how I'm gonna hold the light I may have to roll it in there for my traditional grip based on the size of my hands in relation to the size of light, but whatever. So I can perform my tap wherever I'm gonna tap the gun off of, and then with those four fingers, I can still rack the gun. I can even come up front if my hands are large enough and manipulate off the front back strap, or the, I'm sorry, the front serrations. Not something I do as a traditionally left-handed shooter. Right-handed shooters can do that a little bit easier because their hand traditionally doesn't cover the ejection port when they do it. 
but it's not the end of the world. I can still rack that gun. A retention device is advantageous in the fact that it can give you all of your fingers, or almost all of your fingers, to include your thumb, back to manipulate the malfunction. If I'm using a weapon mounted light, I don't have a handheld, I've gone straight to WML and the weapon light is on, I'm aimed in, I can rock it off. If I'm worried about the light backsplashing or illuminating my position unnecessarily based on the environment, the context situation, I can do my tap off of whatever surface I'm going to do it off of, do my traditional rack, go back to constant on or momentary on. So as far as the weapon mounted light is concerned, not a real big issue. The gun is really telling us what's wrong with it because we get that complete trigger press and chances are it's either an empty chamber or it's a bad round. Now let's look at the slightly more complicated malfunction commonly referred to as the stovepipe. A uh, stovepipe gets its name by the fact that the, uh, the slide comes back and catches the casing uh, in the ejection port right there up against the, uh, the back face of the chamber. Uh, it's called a stovepipe because it looks like a stovepipe. It can present in this way, which is what I think, you know, primarily where it gets its name from. But it can also be what I like to call an inline stovepipe, which is where the casing sits like this. Now, this one is a little bit more concerning to me because you may not immediately see it. And if you're under low light conditions, you may not see it at all. If the stovepipe is straight up textbook and it's sticking up like that and it's blocking my sights, even with a handheld light, my sights are backlit by the light I'm pushing down range with my handheld light or my weapon mounted light. So I'm going to be able to see the fact that my sight picture has disappeared. And if I tr press the trigger, I get a dead trigger. Now a dead trigger tells me one of two things is occurring without any visual input whatsoever. It's telling me either there's a stovepipe or, or an interruption in the cycle of fire occurring or I have what's commonly referred to a double feed which we'll get to next. My primary concern is going to be to somehow diagnose the problem that is occurring on the gun. If the environment is so dark that I have no visual input beyond my weapon mounted light, if my light's back here in an FBI position, it's gonna be splashing or spilling onto the gun and it's gonna show me what's wrong with it. But if I've got it in say a Harry's grip or something like that, I can pull the light back and help diagnose the situation if I have to. Uh, another thing I can do is simply feel the gun. Now this may be one of the situations where I feel the gun, I'm like, okay, that feels like a stovepipe, I can just sweep it out of the way. I still want to tap. This is just my personal philosophy because I may not be able to tell the actual chamber condition. Now it's very unlikely that you'd have a stovepipe occur without a good round being attempted to load into the chamber because let's think about what had to happen. In order for this casing to be here, likely, I had to have a full slide reciprocation extraction and ejection but somehow for some reason that casing did not get out of the way before the slide started to come back forward and put that next round into battery. So the round that's attempting to go into the chamber is probably a good one so just sweeping it out of the way may put the gun right back into service. But I have seen malfunctions uh, and of course these were environmentally specific where the next round did not have an opportunity to get loaded before the casing actually ended up in the gun. Usually what I'd see in vehicle classes is rounds bouncing off the headliner inside of a car, going right back in the gun and interrupting the cycle of fire even worse, almost creating a double or a triple feed, which can't technically have on a handgun. I understand that, but we'll get to that. So it's still a good idea to tap and seat the magazine properly and then rack the gun. You don't have to do it. Sometimes they clear themselves. Of course, I'm being completely facetious. The fact that that happened, I probably couldn't do it again in a million years if I tried and I didn't actually try to do that. Why tap? Well, some people, uh, and I've seen this come up and I've seen some people actually teach this, they teach that tapping can actually clear the malfunction. So that took a lot of hits. That means it's not a consistent technique, which means I'm not gonna trust it, I'm not gonna do it. I'm still gonna add the tap, this is just my philosophy way I teach it, you don't have to do it. I recommend it because it eliminates one other possibility from the equation. And then I gotta rack the gun. If you are a right-handed shooter and you manipulate from the front of the gun, that's fine. However, I would caution against it for this type of malfunction because there is that small likelihood that you could trap that casing in the chamber as you cycle the gun, which can cause uh, very unique malfunctions to occur. My advice to you is reciprocate from the back of the gun. If you've got a flashlight in your hand, again, we kind of already addressed that, it's nothing different. I go to that four finger grip and I'm able to pull on those rear serrations. Uh, if you're into, let's say, as a right-handed shooter, same thing, I've got that grip. I can still manipulate from the front. I can pin like this with my thumb holding the flashlight against the body and still cycle the gun if that's what I want to do. Now, with the weapon mounted light, just like with the, the, the failure to fire, 
Um, it's almost like the daylight technique. Of course, I'm not getting that. I may not be getting that visual data. And especially in this situation, the weapon mounted light is pushing down range because it's mounted on the gun. I can't get that light behind the gun. I may be able to splash it off cover or concealment to give me a little light back on my gun, which can illuminate my position, which is kind of contextual to the situation. That's something I can do. I can go to an umbrella lighting if I'm indoors, get myself some, some splash down on the, the gun to actually see. And of course, I come muzzle up to do a chamber, visual chamber inspection anyway. The light's going up. If there's a ceiling above me, it's going to give me the ambient light I need to visually dive diagnose the problem. If I'm outdoors and it's a really dark environment, I may not have that ability. So when I feel that trigger, I can take my support hand off if I'm going to clear my, if I'm, if I'm going to deactivate my weapon light, if I'm using momentary only or if I'm rock the gun on, as I deactivate that light and I come to manipulate, I can take my thumb right or left-handed and sweep back and feel the chamber. I feel the condition. I can feel that casing in there. I already pressed the trigger and it didn't give me a failure to fire, so I know the malfunction is one of two things. It's either going to be a stovepipe or what's commonly referred to as a double feed. In this situation, I can tap, I can rack, put the gun back into service, reactivate my weapon light, whatever the situation is. The last malfunction we're going to address is what's commonly referred to and colloquially referred to as a double feed, even though Technically speaking, correctly speaking, a handgun cannot double feed because it's not a stagger fed magazine or a stagger fed chamber like you get on an M4 and a lot of rifles that are out there. So I've, what I really have is a failure to extract with an attempt to feed. But everybody understands when I say double feed, this is what I'm talking about. I've got a round that's still in the chamber, probably fired, and I've got another round attempting to load in behind it, which is, creates issues on the gun. Now there is a legacy uh, technique that goes back almost 100 years to clear this malfunction. That's to slock the slide to the rear, strip the magazine, rack the gun multiple times, grab a fresh magazine, reinsert it, rack the gun, reassess the threat. It's a lot of steps and it's something I don't teach because there is a better way. If you've seen my video on handgun malfunctions, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've attended a class, you know exactly what I'm talking about. My technique is a simplified technique to clearing this, which we're gonna get to. However, I first have to diagnose the problem. The trigger is gonna feel on almost every gun I've ever shot, it's gonna feel exactly the same as it feels with a stovepipe. So again, if lighting permits, I can do that visual evaluation. If I'm running a handheld light, I can pull the light back, splash the chamber, do whatever I need to do to get the data I need to fix the malfunction. If I'm using a weapon mounted light, which we'll get to next, things are a little bit easier, a little bit more streamlined, depending on how uh, sensitive your hands are. So we'll just take the uh, weapon light completely out of the equation on this. In order to fix the malfunction, <sighs> I have to clear the chamber. In order to clear the chamber, I've got to free up some things. The legacy technique is multiple steps. It does work. It works very well, but it's inefficient and it's slow. What I'm going to do, and almost every gun is going to allow me to do this, the caveat to this is very, very flush metal floor plates on your 1980s-ish guns, such as a SIG 226, 229, Beretta, uh, some guns like that. If you have floor plates like that, get something with a little bit of grip. If you run a magwell on your gun and you're using an OEM magazine, it's going to be really hard to get your digits in there, and that's one of the reasons I do not run magwells on my guns, is just because something like this happens. So, I'm going to hold the magazine release, which is an important step, and I'm just going to pull the magazine out. Now, at this point, I have a compromised grip on this magazine. So, if it's a smaller gun, single stack 43, SIG 365, and I have another, ma I have another magazine, I'm going to put that magazine in the gun. I'm going to ditch this one. But me, I can just do this, get my index finger up there, put the mag right back in the gun. Why did I put the mag right back in the gun? Because it went in a battery which means it's ready to complete the cycle of fire. At this point, I can rack the gun, which just cleared the malfunction. Now, if for some reason I'm still worried about the gun and the situation allows me to do it, I can rack it again to make sure my extractor is working. But the double feed is now fixed. That's the technique. Now, how do I do that technique with a handheld light? So there's my malfunction. Here's my handheld light. I feel the trigger. Handheld light, I'm able to come back, splash the chamber, see the condition of the gun. With the handheld light, get my four fingers, it still works. I can still get the mag out, I can put the mag right back in, and I can rack the gun. I'm now ready to go back to work. Double feed with the weapon mounted light. Uh, of course, situation dependent, I may be able to splash off my environment, get that ambient light coming down off a ceiling or a roof or whatever, and be able to see my chamber condition as I come back off the gun. Another thing I can do is slide my thumb back, feel the chamber condition. I feel the back of the casing that's in the chamber. I can feel the next round budding up against it, attempting to load, and now I can perform my clearance technique. The very first data, of course, I'm going to get that this malfunction is occurring is it's going to feel either it's a stovepipe or it's a double feed, 50-50. As I come back and feel, I can feel the difference in chamber conditions and understand that what I have is probably that double feed situation, what's commonly referred to as a double feed. The technique at that point, if I'm going to turn my light off, contextual, depends on the situation, magazine out, magazine in, 
rack done, go back to work. Of course, something that comes up because if you're new to that technique that I just showed you, that double feed clearance technique, you probably are suspicious of it, as you should be. Uh, because you've never seen it before and things in firearms, people can throw out some pretty hokey stuff that works well when they demonstrate it specifically, but doesn't necessarily translate to real life clearances. Now, this is a technique I teach in classes and we go over all the possibilities of why that technique would not work. Something that comes up is why would you put the magazine back in the gun? Because it's generally thought that the magazine is the source of the double feed. And on a rifle, that may be true. You may have a rifle where the feed lips have cracked or swelled and it's feeding two rounds at a time. Handguns cannot technically do that. Now, you can swell or crack the feed lips on a handgun magazine, but what I've seen that generally gives you is bullet confetti. Uh, it can be the magazine, which means if you've almost expended the magazine by the time the double feed occurs, or if you have a spare, and you are thinking maybe it's the magazine that caused the problem, of course you can ditch. You're adding one step at that point. So instead of rip, reinsert, rack, reassess, at this point you're ripping, ditching that mag, going to your spare magazine, inserting that into the gun, racking, going back to work. Now, something that comes up as well is, well, if I pull the magazine out and the slide doesn't go into battery. So let's say that actually occurs. So we set our double feet up again, and let's say for whatever reason, I get that magazine out, keeps going into battery for some reason. Let's say it doesn't go into battery. And when I press back out, I get that dead trigger because the gun didn't go into battery. Well, I can add another rack. And generally, if the magazine or the slide isn't gonna go back into battery, it's not subtle. Something else is occurring in that gun. Maybe the casing is stuck. Maybe the, there's a, a slight angle of attack, if you will, on it to where the slide cannot go back into battery. At that point, just add a rack to the equation. You're still eliminating a step. Inducing these malfunctions in classes as well as seeing students actually have them on their guns, uh, I can tell you with a high degree of consistency that this technique works. So if it's new to you, uh, I recommend practicing it. It's a very simple, very straightforward technique, and it takes what's commonly referred to as a remedial malfunction and create basically turns it into what's commonly referred to as an immediate malfunction. So just showing you guys right now, working through these malfunction techniques, actually shooting in low light conditions. Uh, of course, the ambient lighting that's present on the range is dependent on the environment that you're actually shooting in. Real life may not translate. I generally do introduce a little bit of ambient light into my ranges, and I vary it from bright to dim. And I change lighting positions, backlight targets, things like that, because that's what real life situations often look like. If you think about a shooting in any urban setting, there's gonna be significant ambient light to where these techniques Actual feeling the malfunction may not even be necessary. You may have enough ambient light just based on the environment to not even worry about it and be like, okay, I know exactly what's going on because I consciously or subconsciously took in that visual data of what's wrong with the gun based on the way it felt and the way it looked, and I just went ahead and fixed it. If the environment's so dark that you can't see it, these techniques work really, really well under night vision. Uh, because in night vision you may not have near focus or you may not be able to look down underneath your night vision and see what's going on. But um, Looking at it from a handheld light uh, standpoint or a weapon mounted light standpoint, I'm still able to perform clearances efficiently on those techniques and it's only a slight change really for the techniques of actually deactivating the light and putting the light in a position, uh, at least regards in the handheld light, put it in a position where I can still use my hand. With the weapon mounted light, remembering to turn it off if the situation calls for it. Uh, but it's all pretty straightforward. Um, there's not a huge departure. You don't have to really get down into the minutia of creating these dramatically different techniques just because there may not be a lot of light out there. Uh, so it's nothing magic. It's nothing mystical. There's nothing really tactical about it. It's just common sense, prudent techniques to clear the gun because you may have something in your hand or you may need to turn off a weapon out of light before you start your clearance techniques. But lacking visual data, it always is important to remember what the gun is telling you by the way the trigger behaves and occasionally practice those physical checks of the chamber with your thumb or your hand or however you're gonna do it to verify chamber condition before uh, you perform whatever clearance technique you're going to perform. I'm Eric Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.